When I'm on a, did you know that I was on the phone? Yeah, you need to close the door if you're going to go to the bathroom. It's like really loud. Hi, Patrick, you are muted. Try to unmute you. Oh, I think I need to do that. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Good. I actually just turned on that feature where people can't unmute themselves because we want to make sure that you and Shuja don't get yeah. interrupted. We don't have, yeah, because there's always that person who doesn't realize there's noise in the background. Mm -hmm. Or there's like a phone call, there's a ringing because someone's like phone is ringing and they just ignore it instead of like not realizing that everyone else can hear it ringing. Exactly. Um, hold on, I'm going to adjust my lighting a little bit. Sure. Let's try that. It's a little too lit. I have these lights that I use. It's a long story because <clears throat> I do so many of these now that um, I'm still learning. But I think that should be a little better. That's pretty cool what you have in the background. Thank you. Well, I read an article in the New York Times about how to do like Zoom call, like a nice background. Yeah. And okay. I figured, and I this, I mean, I've always had this. This has been, this is my house, but I chose this spot. So I'm, I don't typically do stuff in here, but I move everything over when I do stuff like this. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Are you in California? I am. Cool. I am based. So where are you based in? New York City. Oh, okay. All right. So this is kind of late for you, a little late for a Zoom call. Yeah, not bad though. Not bad. Um, it's been really nice out. The city's feeling much better than it was three weeks ago. Oh yeah? Yeah. Just things feel, I don't know. Things you can sort of see like, a, I don't know. You can see like an improvement in everything. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't go out very much, so I don't really know what the environment is, but I, I like the traffic. If I do have to go into the office, it's pretty nice. Where are you based? I'm in the East Bay, and then the office that I have to go to is in Palo Alto. So, How far drive uh, is that? It's only like 22 miles one way, um, but before COVID, it would easily take me an hour, hour and a half just to travel uh -huh. that distance. Um, now it's maybe half an hour, which is pretty sweet. Where do you <laughs> so I can't, I, I work for uh, several nonprofits. So obviously MIT is one of them. And then the other one is uh, affordable housing. So we manage and develop affordable housing for the Bay area. That's awesome. That's so, so necessary. Wow. It really is. It's incredible. Um, and so with this whole COVID thing, we've been working with other nonprofits to help fund and help people who can't pay their rent because you know we're already in a very uh special population to begin with so having this all of a sudden happen and a lot of our tenants are service workers um they work in the service industry so they're hit really hard so wow. we've been like dealing with a lot of other nonprofits to help 
pay for rent and we have like a whole new system of like how we're going to put people on payment plans and whatever. So it's, it's needed now more than ever. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, New York City obviously is super, super affected. And, mm -hmm. you know, my brother and his wife are artists and like they've gotten, oh. no, they applied for non, you know, unemployment. They applied for all the stuff. They haven't really heard anything. It's, it's really typical, unfortunately. So I don't know what's going to happen. Like it's just in rents here, as you know, are also like crazy high. Super high. Yeah. So where that all goes, I don't know. Oh, geez. Yeah, it's really hard. And I know that people, you know how self-employed usually don't qualify for unemployment. And so luckily California, you know, is on that bandwagon now, but then it took how many months to just, or how many weeks to get the system just up to be able to sign yes. up for unemployment? I don't know. I mean, same with New York. It's the same issue. I mean, I'm self-employed. All my work went away. So I actually applied in April 7th and I've heard nothing. That's crazy. That's, you know. yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. I mean, I have savings that, you know, whatever, but so like, I'm not stressed out about it, obviously, but I just figured like, I might as well apply because I can't. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. But I feel very, um, you know, I really feel for the people who don't have any safety net. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. It's really, yeah. really tough. We haven't even like reckoned with this yet. That's the part that blows my mind. Like people still haven't even like processed what the crazy is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm going to rearrange my books while we're talking because I just realized that. <laughs> Cause you know, I'm just looking at it in there and I'm like, Oh, I should put this one over here. And here's a Stanford book. Do you know this one? Do you know Amy Wilkinson? No. She's a Stanford professor i think her book came out 2016 i think it's a good book it was very well liked although she talked a lot about elizabeth holmes in it and then of course elizabeth holmes uh oh i know <laughs> see there we go really? um, we should put it it has less direct light over here though it look, it'll look nicer um sorry this is how i spend my days um Oh, but it's kind of hard to see the FOMO. Is it? Yeah. It, mm -hmm. it kind of, unless you can keep the book shut somehow. Maybe I can and maybe I can't. Oh, you just bent it. <laughs> I mean, it's my book. I can do what I want to. How's that? <laughs> Does that work or no? Better. Better. Well, I kind of like it on the other side because the lighting, even though you do get a little bit more glare, glare. It, it's much more prominent. Okay. Well, that is helpful because you are on the other side watching this what i can do actually see there's there's things that can be done there's lots of games that can be played here um how do we do on, on registrations we are at 112 oh that's great uh, it's a fantastic turnout how's that okay watch this i like it you gotta turn this down a little there's all kinds of games i see i have to I think that's even better because it's a little less bright. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's I think great. It, I think it, it pops more than yeah. before. The, cool. um, I've been doing a ton of these um, because I can't, you know, this is all I have, um, as it were. But what's been great is, like, they're all full, like, really full. Like, I did one today mm -hmm. in Jordan. So they're nine hours ahead of us. Seven or nine, I can't remember. But anyway, it was like there 930 at night and we had, I mean, in Jordan, and we had 60 people on the line. Wow. Which was great. Yeah. That so was fantastic. Turning up for stuff. I did, what did I do? I did another one. I've done so many. I, mean, I don't even know anymore. And I love them. And I love, you know, and I love your, like the club, MIT club is awesome. So I was honored. Yeah, well, we definitely well, do our best. There he is. I'm trying to unmute him. Are you muting yourself? Because I'm trying to unmute you. I'm also going to make you co-host. All right. Oh, better. Cool.
There we go. All right. Now I can see both FOMO and 10%. Yeah. <laughs> nice what product call, placement. That's what we call marketing. I know. What's going on, man? How you are you? A fancy microphone? No. Oh, come on. You're like a podcaster. Well, like... I, do, I mean, I do have a fancy microphone that I could use um, if you want me to. I don't know. It seems like it's sufficient. I've not gotten complaints. Okay. No, I think it sound okay. Sound good. Uh, yeah, I do have like a nice, um, you know, like a podcasting mic and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, what else? Where, do we need? You? Where is that? Is that Stanford or something? No, you didn't go there. MIT. Sorry, I don't know. Where yeah. I said. Yeah. Come on. Hey, <laughs> wrong school. <laughs> wrong course, buddy. Uh, yeah, I know. That's bad. Sorry. Yeah. Because uh, Stanford uh, doesn't have pass fail the first year, and you guys do. So we do. Well, it's no longer for, uh, for the first year. It's only like first uh, semester. Half year. But I make some MIT jokes then? Is that what I should do? Yeah, you should. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, basically uh, the, um, uh, <clears throat> during COVID, all the students like got together and they created the entire MIT campus in Minecraft. Of course, that's incredible. So they were like, hey, we're like missing each other. So they've like, so this is just one of the buildings and now they've done like inside of the buildings and you can go around in Minecraft and it's kind of super cool. That's actually really cool. Yeah. All uh, right. It's so much clearer than I do. I feel like my, my screen oh. is easy. Uh, because I've got like, you know, spark lights and all that good stuff, you know? I have lights too. No, I have lights, but it feels like it's, I don't know if my camera's dirty. Maybe. <laughs> I think your camera might be dirty. Because it is a little bit cloudy, you know what I'm saying? I know, that's what I'm saying. Well, let's do something. Watch this. <sighs> oh my Sweet. God. So much oh, that is so much better. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a different person. You know what's funny is I watched it earlier today, but I was watching a video of myself. Listen, my laptop's filthy, okay? I've been in quarantine. Like, I'm eating on top of it, but that's great. <laughs> cool. Uh, so the big day is tomorrow? Yes, it started today with a bunch of, like I did a, I was on the radio here, um, LinkedIn's podcast, Hello Monday came out this morning with me on it. Um, uh -huh. big, pretty big show. And then I did some webinars. And tomorrow is the actual book party. And then we have a bunch of other shit through the week. And now it's just kind of like stuff for the next three years. Mm -hmm. So tours from your Zoom sessions. Exactly. And then I'm starting, people are finally starting to um, come out from under their beds from hiding. So I'm getting like people I reached out to six weeks ago that didn't even respond or like coming out of the blue now that want to do stuff together. So I think that's exciting. Cool. Uh, you know, it's been a, a bit hard to get people focused as we talk about, but I think it's now hitting, which is good. So listen, it, it is what it is. You just got to kind of work with the realities of these things. Yeah. All right. So I think we're almost a minute away. Uh, so I think, I don't know if Serena told you, but I think we ended up getting like close to 120 signups. So in the last like 24 hours, it's been is that like, like a high demand vis-a-vis the yeah. user? Yeah. I don't know, man. Patrick, you got to work with your PR guys, you know, I don't know. It's not working. No, really, what's your typical? Is that a good, is that a good turnout? It's actually one of the it's highest good. ones. So yeah. I think our highest one was about 250 people registered for um, uh, one of these virtual events. And then I think this is probably either the second highest or the third highest. This is by far really high, especially for more of a social event. The other ones have been over about like COVID-19 and trying to fix the problem and much more informational um, stuff, whereas this is much more more fun. And this by far, is, it blows all the other ones out of the water, for sure. Yeah, I think what was surprising was just like, just uh, almost like doubling in the last 24 hours, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I'm glad because, um, because it's a perfect audience, you know? It's very much my audience, so I'm wearing shorts, sorry. Um, um, I am wearing shorts. I'm wearing pants. I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. We, we start off like, you know, the, the session with like doing pant checks, you know, so. 
Yeah, no. <laughs> we should... like do like mic checks. We do fan checks. No. <laughs> it was so nice out today. That was the first day I wore shorts, so I just wanted to lean into that a little bit. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Did you go for a run? Last night, not today. Today I was working really hard, but tomorrow is tomorrow. It's like book party, so it's kind of like the Oscars. I'm gonna spend the day taking care of me. I uh-huh. go for a run, you know, and then I'll get dressed. Cool. Um, awesome. And Saria, um, you have the link to the Q and A, right? I do. Mm. from what you sent me but i don't know if i can do anything oh moderate oh that's a very different email oh, what do you need me to do for a slido yeah actually i just realized you don't you don't that's don't worry about it I'm back. i'll be right back I forgot what okay I mean. so i'm gonna keep everyone muted and they cannot unmute themselves Okay. So I made you co-host, all the both of you co-host. So do you have, do you see the edibility of that? The control? Control what? To un, to unmute them if you want to. Uh, I don't know. It's under the participants. And the bottom, it says invite, mute all, unmute all, and then the three dots. Oh yeah, unmute all, yeah. Invite, three... unmute all, unmute all, and then more. Yeah. Okay. So are people admitted in? Do we, when do we get started? I will need to admit them if you guys are ready. There's 47, 48 people and counting waiting. Are you ready? Give the people the show is what I say. All, all right. right, the show must yeah, go me- on. All right. Turn it on and turning me off. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're just about to start uh, our talk with Patrick McGuinness. Uh, we'll just give folks another minute or two to just log in. I think we're close to about 50 odd people. Uh, just give us a minute. And in case you have not, uh, I'm just going to put in the link to the question and answer app uh, in the chat window. So if you have questions, please feel free to post it over there. Uh, you can then see other people's questions. You can upvote them, downvote them, and we'll be able to so we'll call upon those questions as we go along. Why don't I actually pull it up on our screen as well? All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Shuja Keen. I'm the president of the MIT Club of Northern California. And joining me today is Patrick McGuinness. Patrick is a dear friend. I've known him for, I don't know, 15 years, Patrick? Yes. Give or take. Uh, and um, Patrick has, uh, is an investor. He's a world traveler. And um, he's authored two books. And he's been sort of, I guess, like he's with the, he was the author, or he first coined the term FOMO back in 2004. And that has become hugely popular. FOMO, for those who of you who are not familiar with it, stands for fear of missing out. Uh, Patrick, uh, in addition to his most recent book, FOMO Sapiens, which comes out, I guess, tomorrow, uh, Patrick uh, wrote another book called 10% Entrepreneur. And uh, he's a graduate of Georgetown. He went to Harvard Business School. We don't talk about that here in MIT company. Uh, and he lives in New York, speaks like four languages, and he's visited, I don't know, over a hundred countries. And I think Patrick and I have been together in six of those countries. So, um, 
today the format is going to be we're going to spend about half an hour just doing some sort of you know just a fireside chat and talk about his latest book uh and then uh we'll open it up for question and answer uh this is set up as a meeting so you guys can obviously unmute i'd request people to keep yourself muted for now uh and uh use the slido app to ask your questions so as we go along we'll we can see the questions popping up and uh we'll take it from there so patrick welcome how are you doing i'm doing well i'm first of all thank you for having me here thank you shuja everybody shuja and i have traveled to six countries we almost didn't make it out of pakistan when we had a misadventure there but we're here tonight and uh i'm just glad to be with you all i um i have a lot of friends who went to I mit and um i'm looking forward to your questions because i know they're going to be super smart so um i try to bring my a game tonight all right good so but before we get started i mean you're in new york in the center of like this lockdown and covid uh pandemic so how are things over there well in my neighborhood so i live in the west village my neighborhood is has been lightly affected i think largely because people left the city a lot um and so we've obviously been staying in a lot and other than supply disruptions at the grocery stores um it's been calm obviously new york has been very affected and um we shall see how things evolve but uh but things are okay thanks for asking that's good that's good um so let's get started um so you've been sort of uh you birthed the name or whatever the acronym uh fomo can you you know for the for the rest of the audience over here and those who haven't heard the story how did you come up with the term fomo so i'll take you back to the year 2001 i was living in new york city right out of college and i was working in venture capital and the nasdaq we all remember the nasdaq blew up the tech bubble burst and it was incredibly it was a lot of carnage and so like i spent a year of my career just restructuring companies and then of course at the end of in september of 2001 i lived through the 911 uh attacks and i lived downtown and so that was very much front and center in my life and shocking and so i went through this period of intense rethinking and questioning and wondering if the world that i had grown up in was even going to exist anymore and i come from a small town in maine it was very chill it was very there was no fomo there and so that experience kind of convinced me i wanted to really live life to the fullest and so when i got to hbs in 2002 i really entered with sort of my guns ablazing and as you guys know having gone to a school like mit um when it's a very choice rich environment lots of opportunities classes lectures um hbs is super social uh, so there were lots of parties and trips and so it was very overwhelming and i was basically busy from 7 a.m. to midnight every day you know all day all week long and then the weekends were also intense and i did it all i tried to do everything because you know i i come from a small town where i didn't have these kinds of opportunities my parents didn't go to four year colleges and i wanted to make the most out of it and so i did but i also felt a tremendous stress all the time about trying to take advantage and i had this anxiety that i started to call fear of missing out or fomo and when we were graduating from school i wrote an article for the school paper in 2004 it was called uh, social theory at hbs mcginnis's two foes all about fomo and another term fobo or fear of a better option and then uh that was it and then we graduated and it it basically it moved on it stayed at the school and then slowly permeated all the firms that my friends and i went to and then the media and eventually made it to the dictionary in 2013 and here we are today Wow. So let's like double click into it. So can you like sort of help define what is it and uh you know what's the psychology behind it? Yeah, so FOMO is the definition that I have come up with after listen there's so much clinical clinical psychology out there it's incredible how much has been written about this topic. But there's never been a common definition that I think captures um what it is. And so I I I created a new definition and it's it's basically an anxiety that something better is out there than what you're doing right now and that's fed by social media um number 2 it is a a a fear of being excluded from a a favorable collective experience now if we look at that a little further that anxiety that something better is happening out there than what you're doing right now is 
completely based on perception. And in fact, there's an information asymmetry. If you knew what was going on and you actually were there to see what it was, you could make a judgment about what, uh, what you should be feeling or what you shouldn't be feeling. But because you don't know and you are filling in the facts with your imagination, uh, that's what creates the stress because we, you, know, you, you end up adding all these filters. And so that's why as we get older, our FOMO tends to go down because we have life experience and lived experience. We sort of can judge whether things are worth our time and energy and whether we should be feeling the yearnings for them. But uh, when we're younger and have less experience, that's when we have peak FOMO. And obviously these are things that have existed in our culture and, and, and human experience from the beginning. If you go back to the, the first humans on earth, they were keenly aware of what they had and didn't have and what they needed to survive. They were also very much aware that they needed to run in a pack lest they be exposed to being thrown out of that pack and not having good information about how they could survive. And we see that kind of behavior in different animals and swarm behavior in the wildebeest and they travel together. Um, but what has you know, made that go from something that's just sort of um, part of the human experience but not debilitating to where we are today, of course, is social media, technology, information overload, and easy comparison, whereby we can easily generate reference anxiety and really tune into what we think we don't have. So what's like, so, you know, when you take this forward, right? Like what, what, what are the like, sort of the you know, short term and long term implications of this? Is it just about you being like, you know, business school students sitting there and missing out on parties or and not getting invited to the right ones? Or is it something beyond that? So it, it has always been thought about in, in the popular culture as sort of a funny thing. And in fact, I wrote about it when I wrote about it at school. It was in the humor section of the newspaper because I saw it as a kind of a funny thing. I mean, you've got a bunch of sort of type A overachievers in a choice rich environment, you know, and then hilarity ensues, right? But the reality is that uh, what has gone on is even though the media continues to portray it as sort of a funny thing and there's all these memes out there and there's even a dog bone company called FOMO Bones where they put CBD in bones so that they don't, your dog doesn't sort of wait by the door. Um, despite all of that, there are actual sort of real implications to FOMO and there, there are three. The first is mental health. So clinical psychologists have written, they've, they've, they've spilled tons of ink on the, on the topic of FOMO and of course, many of them are based at research universities, so they have an incredible population of undergraduates to study. And they found that FOMO leads to lower general mood, it leads to depression, it leads to stress, it leads to um, oh, sort of a, um, an inferiority, inferiority complex is when people compare themselves to each other. So that's very pervasive. In fact, 56% of people who use social media report feeling these types of feelings. So that's on the mental health side. On the, um, on the productivity side, FOMO compels us to continue checking our devices. And so it feeds into this, um, this time that we spend online, a lot of it wasted on things that don't really give us what you know, what we really want out of our lives, right? You're spending time on, on, uh, on, on social media, on dating sites and all these sort of things, swiping and, and they're not giving people sort of the productivity that they'd want, they'd want in, their, in their normal life. And third is there's financial implications. So not only uh, are there uh, studies by Schwab and others that show that Americans overspend due to FOMO, but also if you look at financial bubbles over time from, you know, the tulips all the way through to Bitcoin and Theranos, uh, when you have people who are investing capital in things based on the perception that easy money can be made and based on this desire to be to not be left out of a, a, an easy chance to make money um, that's when people start running after the herd and invest based on FOMO and of course many of those stories uh, end very poorly for the people who are putting their money into these assets. So is there a, I mean, a lot of the things you mentioned around FOMO are like more on the sort of, it's negative, it's, it leads to stress, it leads to anxiety, it leads to like financial distress. What are like, what is the, the other side of this coin? Is there any like upsides to FOMO? Can you use that to your advantage? Most definitely. So FOMO isn't all bad. And I think what's great about FOMO is that FOMO is that sort of subconscious in you that uh, is whispering in your ear and saying, for example, Say you're working in a corporate job and you see your friend um, starting to work on an entrepreneurial venture, or you're, you see somebody else you know that's doing angel investing and you sort of watch what they're doing and you feel this sense of FOMO. It's like, oh, wow, I really wish I was doing that. Or maybe you even feel a little resentment towards them. I certainly remember when, when I sort of got started, I, I would see people doing angel investing and I felt sort of like this 
yearning, but I was kind of annoyed by them. And when I listened to that, it, what it informed me of was that actually that was something I wanted to explore. And so what I advise people to do is think of FOMO a little bit like drinking a glass of wine or two. A little wine never hurt anybody. Uh, if it's kept in control, actually, you might listen to it and think about doing something, you know, going on the dance floor and, and you know, letting loose of it. Uh, but of course, it's within limits, right? If you drink, you know, to, ex to excess, you may do something reckless and you might end up feeling quite bad the next day. So it's a great opportunity to uncover things that you might want to do and then explore them. And I recommend, I mean, my first book was all about part-time entrepreneurship. So I recommend doing these things incrementally. Don't throw caution to the wind and jump in full-time. Test it out before you go in full-time. See if you even like it. Uncover that information asymmetry that informs the FOMO and see if perception is real or perception is deception before you go all in. Yeah, when I see your Instagram pictures of you traveling the globe, I certainly do get FOMO. So <laughs> they're all lies. I'm in front it's of it's inspiration to to travel more. So <laughs> let me rephrase that. Um, you mentioned another four earlier on, right? Like you talked about, like look, uh, there's FOMO and there's FOBO. You coined both terms. So what what's FOBO all about? Okay, so FOBO is the foe that didn't get famous. So you know FOMO and FOBO. I wrote about in the same article at the same time, I use them both. I never had like a, you know, favorite stepchild yeah, or favorite. whatever. Yeah, I like them both. I, and actually I felt FOBO was much more evocative of my life because um, FOBO stands for fear of a better option. And what that really is about is the idea that when we're trying to make a decision, uh, we wanna maximize, right? We want the very best for ourselves. And as a result, we're unwilling to choose one of the options before us, even if they're perfectly acceptable, out of a fear that there's something better that'll come along, right? Again, fed by information asymmetry. And so as a result, we, we, we hold off and we collect options and we sort of value option value in and of itself, right? And so where, you know, that goes into the idea of, uh, whereas FOMO is something that is the more information you have, you sort of become more adept at dealing with it. FOMO is something that is an, it's an affliction of affluence. And so people who, who are more successful, who accumulate more money tend to have more options, right? They're living in choice rich environments and therefore they are even more prone to suffer from this. Think about your friend who, you know, over time, or maybe it's you, they've become more successful. They have more going on in their life. They have more things they can buy and things they can do and offers for, you know, come to this conference and here's this job and all these sorts of things. And it becomes overwhelming. It's like your entire life is like going to Netflix and trying to pick something to watch on television. And so that's what FOBO is about. And unlike FOMO, which I believe has positive side benefits, FOBO, unlike drinking wine, it's kind of like smoking cigarettes. Bad for you, bad for the people around you, because the secondary effects of FOBO are is that when you never commit, the people around you are waiting for you and waiting for you. And it really transactionalizes relationships and alienates people. Hmm. Is there a third foe coming out, like a foe go? Uh, well, there's foe. I mean, the, the old classic third foe is foe da, which is FOMO plus FOBO equals foe da. Um, What's foe da? Doing, fear of doing anything. Anything? Okay. But, um, but I, I was, before, as the lockdown hit in New York and I was, I, I was sort of traversing my normal life in, in the last days before we all went inside. Um, everywhere, you know, every place in New York was dead. And so I would, I call that FOGO or fear of going out, which has obviously um, been our lives here for the last several months. Yeah. So, so let's uh, change gears a little bit. Uh, I see you've got your book out there and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to get mine. Uh, so, so that comes out tomorrow. So let's dive into it. So uh, can you give us a, we shared the first chapter with, uh, with the audience uh, yesterday. Thank you for sharing that with us. So can you help, uh, can you, you know, help us like, think through how you structured it and what the reader will take away from it? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the question. So first of all, um, yeah, you got chapter one and the book is available for pre-order. It comes out tomorrow. So I would be so grateful if you would consider purchasing it because um, promoting a book during a pandemic is, is a surreal experience. But uh, I really believe in the book and it's been well reviewed and um, you know, so I think it's, I do think it's a helpful, especially in this time, because it's all about decision making and what the book is. Uh, I'm a big believer that the greatest flaw in the business book space is that many of the books could be a very nice magazine article, but unfortunately there's just not enough there to be a book. 
And so I really try hard with both of the books to make them meaty and substantial. And the feedback I was getting is that I achieved that. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, and so the way the book is structured is the beginning is, you know, that first chapter is just kind of a history. It's kind of a fun introduction. And then I really get into both for FOMO and FOBO, the drivers uh, of each of them. them. And then I talk about the effects. So really, how does this play out in the business world? FOMO, I talked about, you know, some of the things around investing. With FOBO, we talk about how uh, large companies cannot innovate as a result of FOBO and the, the startups eat them up. And some, some of these other dynamics around uh, how, how uh, decision paralysis can, can affect uh, companies and people. And then the, the sort of, the, the vast majority of the book is about solutions. So really looking at these two phenomena and then figuring out how you can overcome them by changing the way you make decisions. And the final part of the book is um, about sort of the positive effects of FOMO and then how to deal with FOBO in other people. So it's, it's great to know how to beat your own FOBO, obviously, but if you're sitting at a negotiating table with somebody who is never willing to deal with you and accept anything and, and is very sort of um, uh, recalcitrant, um, how can you deal with that? So that's the structure. and. Um, and there are obviously some, you know, some exercises and things like that also can help you go through those different um, areas. Sure. So somebody just uh, posted a question on Slido. Can you please share the link to the book? Uh, we'll post it in the chat window for everyone. I think it's on Amazon and as well as you can get that at patrickmcginnis.com, I believe, right? So if you want to do like an indie, like indie bound or something, um, if you go to patrickmcginnis.com, you can order it there. And also there's an invite there to my, uh, some of you know Nir Eyal, um, he, he's a West Coast kind of figure. He taught at the D school at Stanford. He's gonna be zooming in from, or crowdcasting in from Singapore. And we're gonna have a fireside chat tomorrow at 6 p.m. So you can, you can sign up at my website if you're interested. Nir is a really, I'm sure you all know him, but if not, he's kind of a master of, of product management, product design, and he's just kind of awesome. Yeah, awesome. Um, so I think you talked about uh, sort of faster decision making uh, in a TED talk recently as well, right? So can yeah. you help us understand that? Like, well, how can you make faster decisions? Yeah, so this TED talk is, um, it's something that came out of the book and some of the work that I've been doing. I've been looking a lot at decision paralysis and how we spend a lot of our time uh, <laughs> using the small decisions to postpone, to postpone the big decisions. And so I see this, it's so pervasive in the business world and anybody who's worked at, um, you know, at um, a company or worked for themselves knows that you can oftentimes use small decisions to procrastinate. And it's also very typical in our daily lives. It's like, those decisions around like, you know, what am I gonna have for lunch? Or shall I go to the gym today? Or what shirt should I wear, um, can for some people, not all people obviously, but for some people can become rather paralyzing. And we all know that person. And so uh, I, um, you know, I wanted to look at that. And I also uh, ended up sort of studying and writing about that. And what I found was, I basically came up with a methodology um, that, 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 that's about decision making in terms of speeding through the quick, sort of the less, the less important decisions, even though maybe it feels important at the time, they really aren't important. And so, for example, you know, we think about decisions, I, 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 I simplify them into three buckets, high stakes decisions, low stakes decisions, and no stakes decisions. Mm -hmm. High stakes decisions are the ones that will matter in the medium to long term and that have financial mm -hmm. implications. Low stakes are things that you won't really remember going sort of the details of making that decision in a month. And no stakes are the things that you probably won't remember deciding in two days. And they're things that have no financial or, um, or sort of um, well-being uh, implications and that are reversible. Because, uh, you know, it may be that for you, a low stakes is a, is, is a, is a high stakes. And it just depends on, we all have our personal calculus, yeah? Yeah. But, um, but what, the, what I talk about is basically that I, I outsource all low stakes and no stakes. Low stakes decisions, I outsource to people. No stakes, I outsource to uh, inanimate objects, literally my watch. If I'm trying to decide between two things, like you know which shirt, left side of my watch is one, right side's the other. I look down where the second hand is and I decide. I've been doing that for 20 years since I was in college. I do it four to five times a day. And of course, I make most small decisions without thinking about these things, but when I'm stuck, Here's the fundamental reality and why this actually works. It sounds a bit, you know, the first time you hear it, maybe you think, well, what is he talking about? But 
I promise you, if you do it, um, it'll work for you. The problem here is that it's not that you're deciding between two things that are radically different. You are indifferent to the point where you can't decide. And so what's happening now is really the person injecting all of the drama and complication into the decision-making process is you. So you must remove yourself. And at this point, it's basically about just getting a decision done and moving forward to the next set of decisions in your day. And so that's a really easy way to do that, even if you're on your own. I'm sure as an MIT person, you could build an algorithm that would do it for you because that's the kind of stuff that you guys do. Um, but I just look down at my, at my watch or my, or my cell phone and see what time it is. So that's great for like, you know, you know things which have low consequences, but like for high stakes, right? I mean, you also have a, you know, you know, you know when you know, you're surrounded by like super smart people, they're over analyzed or they tend to collect too much information and rely, rather than relying on just gut. And sometimes when you are in a corporate setting, you're also, uh, you know, there's the broader implications, right? Like, you know, like there's the old saying, like, you know, nobody will get fired to like for hiring IBM, right? Like, mm -hmm. but that's not a really a right decision to make sometimes, right? So people do take into account, like, what's the, political ramifications of their decisions. So how do you like bring that together? Yeah, I, I, making decisions does require some courage, especially if you're going to make fact-based decisions. And so let's think about something that's a bit more higher stakes, right? Like something that does really matter. There you do have to put in the thinking, right? And so um, what I, the sort of the approach that I, that I, that I put into the work and that, that, I, that I follow myself is really thinking like a venture capitalist. And we're not saying that all venture capitalists are perfect in their decision making. That's clearly not true. But what's, what, what, what I think is valuable about the, about the approach of, of investors, and, and by the way, decisions are like investments. You're expecting a return on them in the way, same way you, you, you do with an investment. What I think works is, is, is valuable is that there is a process in which you are taking uh, due diligence. Uh, you're going in and, and, and basically setting criteria about what you want to know to make a decision. You are doing due diligence to fill in as much of the blanks as possible. And then you are potentially consulting with other people so that when you make a decision, it's based on facts and not perception and, and, and fear of missing out. And so the critical thing with FOMO, like the decision about, about IBM, I, I don't know if that would be a FOMO or FOMO. I'd have to think about that more. But, but when it comes to FOMO here, again, you're getting to the point where it's really critical to look at sort of the facts at hand and compare them with the perception in your head and then think clearly about your motivation. Are you doing this because the herd is telling you? Because everybody says, oh, am I, I'm sorry, oh, McKinsey's great, so therefore we should just do that? Or are you doing that because you believe that McKinsey is truly the best to, to do that? Now, yes, it may be fine to go with McKinsey because nobody's gonna question you, but of course, if you wanna be a leader, um, following the crowd is, is not leadership and so therefore, you want to think carefully about your motivations. And if you decide to just follow the crowd, at least you'll know that you've done it for that reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you've been podcasting a lot, like during the, all this like lockdown going on. So, and I, I guess your, your, your podcast was like recently in the top uh, 25. I was looking at my uh, Apple thing. It was like in the top 10 or something for a brief as well. So uh, talk about FOMO sapiens and how does it, you know, how does it uh, feel to connect with the rest of the world through this medium during this pandemic? It's been very interesting. First of all, yeah, it's, it was weird. Like all of a sudden I'm like just behind um, Gary V, which is we're like, <laughs> we're so different from each other. And I'm like one ahead of Suze Orman, which also, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but anyway, um, listen, I'll, I'll enjoy it while it lasts. And uh, yeah, so the podcast, by the way, I, many of you may have podcasts, and so we can talk about that in Q&A. Um, this was something I started on a lark. Um, I never, I, I, I've been, people always said like, oh, you should start a podcast. And I had massive podcast FOMO, but I also had, I, I had done my sort of thinking around this. And I knew that number one, um, it's much more work than it looks. Number two, um, I didn't want to do it unless I had distribution and could ensure a quality show. And so um, I was able to line that up with HBR over time. I originally started with a different partner and it was kind of a very rough around the edges show, but um, I sort of had my sort of um, MVP that evolved into, into what I have today. And, um, and what's been cool about it and, and enjoyable is number one is the, the world has gone to remote. So your ability to get guests is so much higher now because people have you know time on their hands. Number two is I've learned how to do remote better, but, 
Number three is, um, I think it's a really fascinating time, obviously, to be looking at the business world. So I started my season, um, uh, my, or my second episode with, was about uh, venture capital during a pandemic. And it uh, featured Beth Ferreira, who's a partner at First Mark in New York, who I used to work with when she was at Flatiron Partners and I was at Chase Capital. So we had, we had lived through 2001 together, uh, 2000 mm-hmm. together. And so to be able to talk about this in that perspective, I did a big episode on work from home. I'm doing one about, um, about solo entrepreneurs and focus uh, next week. I've got the president of Chobani on this week. So I think- oh, um, wow. Yeah, he's great. Um, we talk about sort of like building a business that's that's aligned with stakeholders, um, and so it's a show. It's about a purpose driven uh, business as well. Totally purpose driven, and also I yeah. I match that with another segment on a company called Rip Van Waffles, who many of you know. They're very pervasive in Silicon Valley, and so listen, I think um, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, and. Uh, I've seen that people are really hungry for good content right now. That is, that isn't just about, listen, people are getting burned out on, on COVID and not that it's going to go away and not that we shouldn't be paying attention, but we can't, we can't have COVID 24 hours a day. And I think there's a real hunger out there for people, for, for looking at where we're going now and kind of what we need to do to be successful in the next period. And so I'm trying to fill that gap. Oh, uh, so I'm going to do one last question from me, and then we're going to switch over to the audience. Uh, I think uh, for those of you who joined in late, uh, I just put in the link to uh, Slido in the chat window. So please put your questions there. You could also upvote questions people have already asked. Uh, so if you're thinking about the same thing. So, uh, so you've, how many total countries have you visited now, Frederick? 103. 103. So for somebody like you, and I think I travel just as much, do you have like travel FOMO right now? You know, it's, I'm sure many people who are here travel ton too. And what I, I have realized is that um, when you get in that cycle of just traveling all the time, um, it takes a lot to break out of that is takes probably six weeks. Pandemic. Yeah. Right. And then when you break out of it, you kind of, it's kind of addictive, right? You're like, because it kind of validates ourselves and it's exciting and it's like the rush of travel. But I have to say that I'm actually quite pleased that I did go to those places and I'm thankful that I had those experiences. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm, I'm sort of, in, I don't enjoy being locked up in my apartment all the time, but I enjoy, I, I must say that the fact that things have moved online, like I've done um, in the last week, I've done these kinds of conversations all over the world, everywhere from, um, you know, I was in Jordan this morning, I've been in California and Mexico. And so the ability to leverage online in a new kind of way, and I think it's, it's cool. But uh, I, I definitely am looking forward to tra- traveling again, although I don't know if I want to like travel to Europe with a face mask. So I may not be going too far. Well, or a two week quarantine after you land over there. How are you going to eat on the plane if you're wearing a face mask? That's the question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think I miss uh, airplane food though, so that's fine. No, no. Uh, so let's switch over to some of the questions uh, the audience has been asking. So I'll just start from the top. Uh, thoughts on operating well in a climate where people's options are limited, are more limited than before, example, due to loss of jobs, et cetera. It's funny because, uh, not funny, but it's, that's a point that I've been thinking a lot about. I really, um, in fact, that last week I started sort of thinking exactly about that because there has been this, um, this press ink spill, like in the New York Times had two stories in two days. One was FOMO is dead, enjoy the JOMO. And the other was the FOMO survived the coronavirus. And I thought to myself, actually the one that that is really impacted because by the way like yeah fomo we didn't have it for a couple of weeks because we were all at home quarantining and cooking and whatever we did shuja was doing beekeeping which is incredible but then you know we still had our phones with us and i mean look at your screen time it's like it's moved online in a lot of ways it's really insane did you achieve all those things you thought you would do during quarantine like it's been two months like it's it's just amazing how we've sort of adapted ourselves um but FOBO, on the other hand, is it's all dependent on a choice-rich environment, right? And so I think here you do see uh, this disappearance of options. I have kind of two thoughts on that. Um, the first is that uh, 
the sad thing is about this is when we have FOBO, we think that our set of options will remain static or grow. But in fact, if we delay, we may lose options. So think about the people who were the slowest to respond to the pandemic. The things that they would have maybe not wanted to do two weeks ago, now they would be very happy to have as options, but those are off the table. So uh, it's important to remember that options, of course, are, are not static and that you can get better ones or, or certainly worse ones as you delay decision making. The second is that um, I think it's important at this period of time, I, I was in some Syrian refugee camps a couple of years ago, and it occurred to me that that was one of the first places I'd been where literally nobody had FOBO because people were stuck. They, like, they were just waiting to go home. And so it really struck me. And so I think in this period of time when we have less options, you have really two responses. The first is to try to find a way to generate options but I think, you know, and that, that's always something we should be doing, right? So that, you know, we can, we can make a good decision. Uh, but I think the second thing is to be, try to value and be grateful for the options that you do have. I had a mental health expert, um, Yael Melamed, who's in San Francisco, I was on the pod like three weeks ago. And her point was, even though you have less options than before, you vis-a-vis -vis many, many people in this world, are still very fortunate. And so focus on valuing those things. And I think it'll make, it just kind of puts you in a better spot to operate from a, a place of good feelings rather than depression. Cool. Uh, I think the next question, can you please uh, share the link to the book? I think we put, it, put that in the chat window already, uh, but you can just go to patrickmcginnis.com and you can see all the options to buy it. Uh, next, question. In the new normal of the pandemic, many are fearful of holding on to what they have rather than missing out. Tips on making bold decisions during tough times. Oh, that's a great, um, that's a great question because I certainly feel that way. So um, I was a very, very, and Shuja knows this, like 2008, I worked at AIG um, in the private equity group. Didn't matter. Uh, my stock fell 97% and um, it was an extraordinarily painful experience. So painful that I actually got, because um, I thought like, oh, I went to Harvard MBA, like I'm going to, you know, how could this happen to me? I don't know what I was thinking. I was totally deluded. But, um, and I'm very, I was very risk averse. I grew up in a small town in Maine, you know, I don't have some trust fund. And so um, it really rocked my world to the point where I ended up like, you know, on a heart monitor. And that experience was such a crucible experience for me that I made some decisions about how to live from there. And I really changed my whole approach to be diversified. And so like, that's what my whole first book's about. And you know, that's just how I, I believe for me is the right way to operate. Now, what I would say is this, if you haven't read the book Flourish by Martin Seligman or this little number, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor, I recommend them to you because he talks about this, this, this uh, phenomenon that I, I had never read positive psychology. I thought it was very fluffy, but in fact, it's quite interesting. Uh, uh, Post-traumatic growth. So when something bad happens to us, you know, the old traditional way of thinking is something bad happens and then you're, you have post-traumatic stress or you revert to normal. In fact, there is this notion of post-traumatic growth that we can actually come out ahead because we realize what matters to us and then we, are ability, we have an ability to take decisions based on those core principles. So what I would say in response to your question is, um, think about that, that I think is a really good way to think about your trajectory going forward. It's like, this is, you, you know, you've lost, you've gone through, we're all kind of like at the, the casino, we lost everything. We gotta figure out what we're gonna do. And if you're gonna make a change in your life, the stakes are so low right now in terms of like, you know, why we've lost so much, you might as well tap into that. Look at this as a chance to grow and fortune favors the bold, obviously. We all know that 2008 produced a lot of companies that have gone on to become very successful. So I think some of those things can be helpful as you think about that risk reward going forward. Hey, Patrick, uh, the couple of questions which popped up, can you uh, repeat the names of the uh, books you mentioned, The Happiness Phenomena? Uh, sorry, uh, The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor. Um, that was a book, he spoke at HBS reunions or, or an, another person who had taught positive psychology. And I read that book and what I love, so Flourish by Martin Seligman, he's at Penn. It's a wonderful book. It's, it's a bit of a longer book. 
the happiness advantage is the kind of thing you can read in two days and it's a beautiful book and um I love Sean. I'd never met him. I actually like out of the blue emailed him and asked him to blurb my book, which he kindly did. And I just wrote him like the, I seriously, I fanboyed out all over. It was kind of, it's embarrassing, but I just thought his book captured, it just captured, it was so digestible and accessible that I give it to kids, um, like teenage kids. But also it really resonated with me who's, you know, I would say relatively sophisticated. So it's a wonderful start. Um, to read that right after you read my book, of course. Of course. Um, so moving on, um, I find myself trying to maximize any given option. For example, going to a restaurant, and substituting, changing, etc. How does this fit within your framework? Absolutely, and that you know, one of the inspirations for this this book um, was because I have a very good friend who um, you some of you probably know, but I'm not saying who it is. Um, who is that person? Literally lives their life, walks into the restaurant, sits at the table, and then says, actually, can we move over there? Um, goes to the hotel and has to change rooms three times. Has to move, I mean, you, some of you are like, yeah, that's me. I get it. I know, I get that. Um, it, listen, there's nothing wrong with wanting the best. But when your life becomes a project in maximization, where the process of maximizing is actually worth more to you than the end sort of benefit itself, and you're spending time and energy on that to the detriment of your life and the people around you, that's where you have, you know, you have a problem. So like, I definitely have gone through phases like that. And that's why I tend to outsource those things to other people. And so I would think about, you know, are you, and ask people in your life, like, do you think I'm an optimizer to the point where you find it annoying? And, and, and also think about how much time you spend on decisions. And as you do that, you can begin to implement strategies where you, you sort of, you know, it doesn't have to be you flip a coin on everything, but like what I do, for example, with hotel choices, is I'll tell somebody like a travel agent or whatever is making my travel, here's my basic criteria, can you just pick something? And then I just let it ride. And maybe it wasn't the perfect, 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 but frankly, you know what, I gained back mental space that I can dedicate to things that are far more sort of consequential in my life. And the thing is, final, final point on this one is like, all those things seem to matter until like right now we're living through a global pandemic. Do you really care? Like, no. So it's time to realize what matters and what doesn't and focus on what matters. Cool. Uh, next question. Do you think FOBO also results from a tendency to overanalyze and collect too much information rather than rely on gut feeling? I think we discussed this already, right? Yeah. I mean, analysis paralysis in the age of big data, especially for sure. It's definitely part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you typically want to optimize high stakes decisions? In this case, wouldn't FOBO be beneficial? I think we also covered that earlier. Uh, Let me just hit on that one really quick, which is that, um, so you do, there is nothing wrong, there, there's absolutely nothing, nothing wrong with wanting to maximize actually, especially when it comes to the big decisions. And in fact, we can think of many companies and leaders who are going, they want to be the best and they get there. The difference is that they are decisive. And so that's the problem with FOBO is you're indecisive because your process is flawed. And where the process is flawed is that people with FOBO are unwilling to make a choice and let go of what they can't have. They want to kind of have everything. It's like the, you know, the sort of like, you know, I'm dating 17 people, right? And I keep swiping on Tinder. And so that's the process. And this isn't the, in the TED video I made, I kind of lay out the process on is, is about, it's a process whereby you, you, you let go of things and then permanently eliminate them because it's the pathology happens when you keep going back to things that you should have eliminated, keep going back and you get into a feedback loop. that's very unhealthy. Good. Thanks. Um, Next question, when feeling FOBO, fo when the feelings of FOBO or FOMO arise, is it just best to fall upon the facts and your motivations for the options and the considerations to lessen that anxiety? Yeah, so what you really, the goal um, is to, so we, you know, at the, you, you put it in there. Um, did you put the word Anxiety. Um, when we have FOMO and FOBO, we forget that it's about fear. It's about risk aversion, right? And so, Getting into the facts helps remove the fear so that your intuition can do its job based on facts and not emotions, right? But the, there's another element that I think is very helpful, which is that 
so part of, I always say the, to overcome FOMO and FOBO, you have to find the power to choose what you actually want. So, you know, know what you want and you have to have the courage to miss out on the rest. And so the courage to miss out on the rest, like we may make a wonderful decision, but then the external forces, the pings and the dings and the people and the pressures and the mom wanted this and you know, whatever, they take us away from sticking with our decisions. And so there's a real focus, and I have a whole chapter on this, about the missing out bit. And that is things like making changes in the way you relate to technology, never bringing your phone in the room, um, meditation and mindfulness. I mean, if you practice meditation and mindfulness, what you're really doing, you're doing a lot, but one really great benefit is that that sort of information asymmetry that you're feeling in your head, when you're doing meditation, you're in the here and now. You're not in the world of hypotheticals and, and projection. And so it helps to train you to be um, more rooted in the realities of where you are rather than in the fantasies of your mind. And so that's also really powerful. True. So not running multi-threaded simulations in your mind. Uh, <laughs> by the way, talking about meditations, uh, Scott Globus is here. Scott is doing a meditation uh, 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 session tomorrow at 6.30, so feel free to sort of join in, so. it's awesome. Uh, yeah, uh, is there a favorite uh, meditation app, Patrick? Yeah, so, okay, so first of all, I am a pretty spastic person. Maybe you're getting that right now, high energy. And I always wanted to meditate and I couldn't do it. In fact, my brother has been meditating for years, um, twice a day. And I tried to go with him. It didn't work for me. I don't know. I just, and I'm, I always kind of was like, what is this meditation stuff? Is it, you know, is it for me? Um, and I started going to classes because I think it's really helpful. Anything you want to do well, learn from somebody who can teach you. I learned that there's different styles and, you know, you can find something that works for you, which is really powerful. And then um, I basically did two things. Number one is I started using Oak which is a wonderful app just for the timer. I don't do a guided meditation. That's not for me. Um, it may be for you, but I prefer a silent meditation, like a gratitude meditation. And I just read a wonderful book by Jay Shetty that's coming out in the fall that kind of gives some great tips and he's been doing them online. But the secret was um, I had a buddy who also wanted to start meditating and we decided to have, create an accountability uh, situation. So we use an app called Habit Share and every day we check in that we meditated. And I started using that and I've gotten to the point where I've meditated like, I think 191 days in a row today. And I see the differences and um, it's wonderful. And um, it's a lot of fun. And I've invited a lot of people. If you ever wanna be part of my accountability group, just reach out to me. Um, uh, and um, that has been, I think, really transformational for me because part of me is I'm gonna admit it, and this is weird, but I'm a little competitive. So with myself and others, I, I want to stick to the plan. But then also it's become something that I just, it became, you know, it's like an everyday activity now. So it really helps for me. Yeah. Were you experiencing FOMO when you're not using it? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I mean, I definitely want to keep up the trend. The last time I missed it was on Diwali. I went to somebody's Diwali party. And by the time I realized I forgot it, I had a couple of drinks and I was like, it wouldn't be honest with myself to do it now. So... <laughs> All right, so uh, just a quick time check. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, is it easier to manage FOMO and FOBO by changing your inner states versus trying to control the external environment? I think it's um, the, the, the choosing what you actually want is an internal exercise. The missing out on the rest is more of an external exercise. And so they kind of go together. Um, and I think the, we, we talk about easy. Um, I think that there's a lot of hacks you can do on the missing out part. And I'm sure you, I mean, if you, there's so much out there in the Tristan Harris kind of world about, um, the attention economy and all that stuff is very powerful in the space. And so I feel no, you know, I didn't, I didn't rewrite their, their books because like they're way better than anything that I would write. Um, but I do think that 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 stuff is very valuable. And then on the other side, choosing what you actually want to do, that's really hard, right? Because it requires us to reflect. It's not just about changing, you know, your phone to grayscale. Mm. All right. Um, 
here's a question. The root of FOMO seems to be maximizing ROI. Uh, when making a decision, how does one assess ROI when majority of the information you have to work on is very subjective? Yeah, I think the when it comes to FOMO, the I, I would say it's more of a FOMO thing. I, so I think with FOMO, what's happening again is you are you are you are seeing some opportunity. Like let's say it's college choice, right? And it's like you you don't really know. You maybe you haven't visited the schools, and you, you, in your your head you're cooking up a bunch of scenarios. Like if oh if I go to MIT. I'm going to be an astronaut. And if I go to whatever other school, I'm going to be this and stuff like that. But you, those are all dreams and hopes and emotions and they're great and they're subjective, but there's also plenty of sort of objective decision-making that could happen that could help to supplement and give you a fact-based decision sort of to, 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 to make. And so of course there will be subjective angles, but by making sure that you have looked at the facts and that you are tying some of your decision making to facts and that your your decision making isn't simply based on a perception and on a desire to follow the crowd um, you may in the end make that decision based on some on some perception that's still okay but you want to lessen that because at the end of the day every decision has risks you have to go with your gut at some point but you want to remove as much of the sort of emotion from that as possible cool. Uh, I'm going to switch gears. Uh, I think uh, this is an interesting question. Somebody asked the question about your about 10% entrepreneur. Uh, it's a really fascinating topic for me as well. Uh, you want to sort of delve deeper into that? Yeah, and Shuja, you, you're a classic 10%er. Um, okay, so the story is, as I mentioned, AIG blows up. I realized I'm not diversified, and I realized that I was too afraid to be an entrepreneur. Like, I had all these friends who were out being entrepreneurs and they were killing it. Silicon Valley like did great in 2008. And I was like, thinking to myself, boy, I've really messed. I made the wrong choice. I should be an entrepreneur, but I just, I was not in the place. I was very risk averse. Um, it's by nature. And so I thought, why don't I just do some stuff on the side, invest in people's companies, um, be an advisor to companies where I can be helpful and they'll give me stock maybe start some things. Um, there's a friend of mine, Felix Dushevsky, who went to MIT class of 99. He and I started working on stuff together. And um, that was my entree into entrepreneurship. And I ended up doing um, a couple of things that really hit. Uh, one of them was, is called Ipsy, which is a company out in California that's done really well. I was an early investor in that. And so I started to see that these things could take off and built a portfolio that includes real estate. I invested in it. Play, I have startups, I've been an advisor to companies and built this portfolio over time. And what it gives me and anybody who does this is diversification, access to upside. Um, it's fun and interesting. You meet people, you learn how to be an entrepreneur. And oftentimes the, um, the, uh, I think that sort of the, the counterpoint on that or what people, the skeptics would say is, well, you know, you can't be an entrepreneur part-time and you, you got to go all in. And, you know, if you're not like eating ramen, then it's not real. And listen, if you want to do that, like I respect that. Um, if you have the financial wherewithal, if you have the sort of idea, if you're not afraid, um, or if you have family money or something, like go do that. But for the rest of us, taking an incremental approach, albeit slower, actually do risks the idea because you don't have to worry about monetizing something or raising capital in the early stages. You start it up, you see how it goes, um, and then when the idea works maybe you go do it full time. And so it's a very flexible way to engage with entrepreneurship. And um, it's been incredible to see how many people have done this in the world. And so it's, um, it's, it's um, you know, I, I really believe in it. And I think it's what's cool about it is it is flexible. So people can kind of customize it to their own, to their own conditions. I've, you know, I've spoken all over Africa and Africans are, they're very creative people and they have to deal with an economy that's very informal. So this is a great sort of tool book for people to be entrepreneur, entrepreneurial in developing countries. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think like, um, you know, in how many languages has the book been translated into? 10% uh, entrepreneur? It's in um, like 10 or 12, I think. 10 or 12. Wow. It's all over the world now, huh? It's crazy. crazy. Yeah, no, it's nuts. Cool. So we've got five more minutes. Uh, I just want to be cognizant of time here. I know it's getting late for you. Um, oh, what's the name of the meditation app again? They couldn't hear. It's called, sorry about that. It's called Habit Share. 
And it's, it's, it's kind of a janky little app, but I love it. It's really simple. So and it's a iOS app or Android or both. Um, I know, I assume it's both. It's definitely iOS. Okay. Got it. Uh, so people want to have, Oh, what motivated you to learn four languages? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm from a small town in Maine where, um, it's very American. Uh, and, um, I, I got a scholarship to study in Argentina when I was a junior at Georgetown. I learned Spanish. I realized I was good at languages. And so then I worked in Latin America investment banking, decided to learn Portuguese. They paid for my lessons and sent me to Brazil. And then after the financial crisis as part of my post-traumatic growth time. Um, I had a lot of free time on my hands as I tried to sort out with my life. And um, I'm French Canadian. My grandparents are Quebecois, but they were actually super kind of discriminated against. And so they didn't even speak French with each other. And so we lost our language. And I decided since I spoke some other romance languages, I should sort of like get that back. And so I started studying French. In fact, before I came here tonight, I was in my Zoom French class. And, uh, you know, language is a great way to connect with people. So it's been awesome. I've done, I've done book tour in all three of those languages and it's been really rewarding to be able to do that. Yeah. And you spent time working in those different regions and where you use, use that language as well. Um, so here's uh, somebody looking for advice for overcoming risk aver uh, averseness. Ah, that's a great question. Again, I think it comes to, for me, right? Because again, I have become far less risk averse now. I mean, I was, my friends used to call me Captain Safety and um, make fun of me for be the wimpy one in our group. This was like, in, you know, right out of say 2004. And then um, the, Shuja and I were like traipsing all over Pakistan and having the ball. So I, I think, you know, it's funny. Um, and then of course, with the 10% entrepreneur, um, I've gotten involved in all kinds of ventures and done things that I would have never done before. So I would say number one is um, travel was a great way to push myself out of my comfort zone and because um, I liked it. And so I was willing to take risks there where I wouldn't take elsewhere. So think about the parts of your life where you are willing to take risks, whether it's in sports or travel or whatever, and lean into those because they help build the muscles you need. And on the areas where you're scared, I would say take an incremental approach, put a toe in the water, see how it feels, stick the foot in, then, you know, maybe you go all the way up to like the knee and then jump in. Cool. Uh, so last question from the audience. Do you think uh, FOMO is more of a in the moment thing as opposed to I'm upset, I missed out on that and I'm, or I'm scared of missing out in the future? Uh, I think it's, I think that it's both. So I, we have all these feelings when we're, we're triggered by the, you know, the social, okay, like the social networks. But I read some stat recently, which I don't, I cannot cite a, um, I cannot cite a source for you. But it was something like, actually, Jay Shetty told me this. He said that they did an experiment that uh, if a person had a choice between being left alone with their thoughts for 15 minutes or receiving an electric shock, and some shocking number of people went for the shock. Why? Because being alone with our thoughts, we start to get into the deeper FOMOs. Like I didn't, I don't have kids or so, you know, I never lived my truth, you know, all this sort of stuff. And that is, that's like the heavy FOMO. Um, should I, have I found my purpose? And so I think that the short-term FOMOs are like this, the flies that we swat at and we need to move beyond them quickly and then that leaves us the bandwidth to maybe consider some of the bigger questions in life and deal with them. Cool. So I think we're right on the top of the hour. And Patrick, thank you so much for spending the time and good luck with uh, uh, your, pro your, your book launch tomorrow uh, in the middle of the pandemic. So I really appreciate you taking the time and best of luck. Thanks so much. And everybody, um, I'm sure you'll send out info, but if you want to connect with me, uh, if you text, FOMO to 66866. You can find me there. It'll, there's a way to sign up for stuff. So um, thanks a lot, everybody. Really smart questions. I'm not surprised and I appreciate your time. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Juja.
Thank you so much. Hopefully we get to see each other soon. Yeah, uh, inshallah. <laughs> All right.